March 4th, 2014, Wellcome Trust, two gentlemen said we should have a BRCA challenge or a BRCA challenge, depending which language they were speaking. Little did they know when they said that, that they were going to spend an uh, inordinate amount of time over the next seven months uh, making the BRCA challenge a reality. And so with no more, I will introduce Steve Chanak from NCI, John Byrne from University of Newcastle and HVP to talk to you about the BRCA challenge. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever the time zone is that you live in. Uh, you know, this meeting has a wonderful international flavor to it. Uh, I think it's a very exciting opportunity and we're going to in the next, you know, 12 to 15 minutes talk to you about uh, where we are on the BRCA challenge. And I have to point out this was one of two things that was nominated. The other one has not gotten enough traction yet, but I just wanted to put a plug in for that. And that is taking something like the BRAF 600 mutation somatically and asking the question, what is the world's snapshot of mutations across all tumors look like? Because that is an actionable, druggable target. And I think that that's the kind of thing that remember in cancer genetics and genomics, there are at, at least two genomes. We're going to talk about the germline, but the somatic is equally important. And hopefully, there's some in the audience who will pick that up. To me, that was a very exciting opportunity. I only have bandwidth for this, and this bandwidth has gotten pretty wide so far in the last few weeks. So I won't take anything more on, otherwise I'll get in trouble with Harold. Uh, but I think that uh, it's really an exciting time, and I'm going to turn it over to John to start with, and then I'll come back for some latter comments. Thanks, Stephen. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a BRCA1 or BRCA2 expert, but I have spent three decades working as a clinical geneticist in the National Health Service in the UK and two decades as a researcher running a research institute. And more recently, chaired a lot of international things like the Insight uh, Society and ESHG and, of course, HVP, as Peter referred to. I'm involved in that with Ingrid Winship, Gary Cutting, Johan Dundun and others. And now I'm actually responsible for genetics research at the National Institute of Health Research in the UK and on the board of National, the NHS England. And our challenge is to implement the 100,000 Genomes Project. So um, I think I, I, something David Alshuza said in his introduction resonated with me when he said, this is my life. Uh, and I came into this room through a slightly different door, but I think many of us have come here saying, this is now the time that we have to get a hold of this and carry it forward. Um, so we were challenged with uh, dealing with BRCA uh, at the March meeting and we built on that at the UNESCO conference that uh, uh, Mandy Spurdle organized next to the HVP meeting. Uh, and our mission is to translate the rapid expansion of sequence information into useful knowledge in particular and how to rapidly interpret variant data into clinical utility. And those challenges are fairly straightforward. We've got to share the data. Johan Den Dunnen impressed on me many years ago, getting the data is the key issue. Uh, and if we can also build on our new genomic power to pull together with an API all of that data sitting in, uh, in the genomic centers, then clearly we can really start to uh, put this together and answer some serious questions. We've already heard from Bartha uh, about the social and ethical and legal dimensions of this, which we're all aware of. Uh, and importantly, though, we need to recognize that this is not a new challenge. Uh, we've actually got a lot of data out there already that we need to pull together. And of course, as we've already heard from Catherine, this, this was proposed not as an end in itself, but as the classic challenge, uh, which will act as a, a, a precursor to all of the other uh, clinical translations that we expect to have in the near future. Um, I didn't write this slide, and I had to ask Farah what instantiation meant. Um, and it apparently, Stephen tells me, is one of David Altshuler and Eric Lander's favorite words, and Harold Varmus thinks it's cool. So I thought I'd leave it in. <laughs> um, so for, for Bartha and Kazuto, who are doing the plain English translation for the Ethics Committee, it means uh, getting things going. Uh, and um, I checked with Mandy Spurdle, apparently the Australian translation is getting off your ass. <laughs> now, I'd like to take you to the bottom of this slide to look at the, the, the fact that we've had a few past di disagreements in the world of BRCA1 and BRCA2. And the name won't appear anywhere else on the slides, but of course you all know that we have a challenge with Myriad. 
that Myriad have chosen not to share their data for actually very good commercial, narrow commercial reasons. I hope they'll change their mind because I think the time has come to revisit that decision. But we shouldn't forget that Myriad's uh, control, if you like, because of the patents, was essentially an American one. Uh, the NHS in England didn't recognize those patents and carried on sequencing and the European Union overturned the patents over a decade ago. Uh, so in fact, there is another myriad, a myriad with a small m of silos all over Europe, of vast quantities of very high quality data, every bit is the equal of myriad's database here in the States. So we can actually use that knowledge provided we can get it together and get those silos broken down. And so we mustn't lose that existing knowledge, but we must also build on it uh, and bring in the new data. And I won't um, read that out for you. You can see that you all know where that new data is. So it's bringing together the old and new to really do something very different. This, this is a very long list of important people, and it's not comprehensive. Uh, it was uh, you know, drawn to my attention by Gary that it looks, as, I, as someone said at the March meeting, more like the NATO alliance than the global alliance. Um, and it, there's no doubt that this is very heavily skewed towards the US and Europe uh, and Australia. And we need to have the leaders from all over the world come together because we've got to do this once. We don't want someone coming out at the end saying, oh, actually, we've just decided to do it a slightly different way. This has got to be a truly global solution to a very obvious clinical problem. Uh, and I'd like to particularly mention Amanda Spurdle, Mandy Spurdle, who's done a tremendous amount behind the scenes with our organizing team and also Naz Rahman uh, to try and get us to where we are now. So we've got some fairly obvious tasks. We need to aggregate data. We need to interpret the variants. And we've created some uh, subgroups, well, one of which will overlap directly with our regulatory and ethics working group, the Global Alliance, uh, others which will be specific to the BRCA challenge. Uh, and again, I don't need to read all those out to you. They're all fairly obvious. But this is really a very important slide. And the one uh, we wanted to put Heidi's name on the title slide because she went off and did something which was really very valuable. She went and read all of the databases uh, to see what was in them and how they overlapped. And that's the embarrassing truth. And Gary would point it out that if you actually take any other genes, you'll get the same result. You take important databases that don't even share each other's information. Never mind all of that stuff that's lost out there in the silos that never even got to the databases. So what we have got to do is make that, well, if, I'm not sure if I've got color blindness, but I think it's about orange, green, and blue circles to all sit on top of each other. You know, if that's not a big deal. I mean, that's a very obvious thing we've first of all got to do. And then we need to expand that. We've got Antonio uh, here from Simba. We've got uh, Mandy here from Enigma and other data sets. We need to bring them all together. It isn't asking a lot on behalf of our patients that all the knowledge we currently have be in one place where it can be read by clinicians. And if we're going to make this test cheap, then we've got to take the hours of processing off the clinical scientists and give them this information in one place at one time. So we've already been uh, having our international teleconferences and Mandy in particular has been waking up at some very strange hours to have conversations with us. And we've already solved, I think, one problem on nomenclature, and we'll talk about that in detail tomorrow. But clearly, we've already heard today. We want to minimize reinvention. We want to take what already exists. We want to break down the silos, pull it together. We need to bring together the true experts, many of whom are in the room, to get them to agree to a single global solution to this problem. And then we need to find all those other sources of data that haven't yet joined the Global Alliance to bring their knowledge to, to bear as well. I'll hand over to Stephen now. Thank you for that brilliant instantiation. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to pick up and talk about what uh, I think in our uh, myriad of conversations has really been really focusing on three particular deliverables. Uh, and the first one we think is the fastest one to success, and that is the population-based assessment of allele frequencies of variants using available sequencing resources. And so looking at 1,000 genomes, publicly available exomes, other things like, <coughs> excuse me, 10K UK, 
and even potentially we, having been part of the TCGA, looking at how to use the aggregate of particularly the somatic data because the germline from TCGA and I think from ICGC are more complicated in terms of sharing. But, you know, with some caveats, with high coverage, we know we can learn an awful lot about what's embedded in there. Um, and, and that will be part of the process of working through something that has quite a bit more depth than just saying and declaring that we're going to connect all these things. We know that there's an awful lot of next generation sequencing going on and in the non-cancer, non-BRCA world and that's the resource that we want to be sure that we come up with the wise solution to be able to capture so that this becomes a dynamic process that may help us with the classification of a small fraction of the BRCA mutations that are clinically challenging to see that their frequencies may be either too high or for that matter, very low when we really start looking across the world and allowing, you know, the, I think the more reasoned and, and, and the more detailed analysis thereof. So the second proposed deliverable is really this idea of a federated database or data collection of what we would consider to be the pathogenic variants in BRCA1 and 2. And this is to really build a structure for data sharing where we would be able to go base by base across each of the genes with a kind of beacon with a degree of outcome. And the, one of the real challenges of BRCA, uh, both one and two, is there is a tremendous, very large existing data sets out there that have come from diagnostic labs, commercial labs, academic consortia and the like. So, you know, this is as big as we're going to see it, per se, in terms of the existence in many different places. Uh, and we'll want to begin with the publicly uh, available data set sets that, you know, where there are uh, depositions in ClinVar and LOVD, UMD and the like, and just connect those as, as John had pointed out, those Venn diagrams are really are, are kind of a sad commentary on where we are not at this particular time. And at this time, we also, as we have the expertise gathered in, try and update and bring all the different consortia so that all the data sets are available through this federated database. And most importantly, that any given submitter only needs to do it once, because that's one of the complaints just among the BRCA experts. Well, I need to do it right-handed over here, left-handed over there, only on Tuesdays here. And that's something that we just, we have to get past very quickly. And then, of course, as in doing this, we have sort of the peace in the American Peace Corps mentality. We'd be happy to capture 50% of the world. And if we can get to 60% and 70%, and in that context, inviting diagnostic and other data sources to join whenever they would believe that it's in their best interest to participate in this. But the idea is not to necessarily set our standard as everyone right off the right off the bat and say that we would not succeed unless we had captured every BRCA uh, mutation or variant sequenced out in the world. And that, that would be unreasonable. And I think with the expert panel that we have, or the expert steering group establishing consensus, and where I think we'll begin, certainly tomorrow in a lot of the conversation leading up to this on both conference calls and individual teleconferences and, and emails, is to really begin with putting together a list of the non-controversial, highly pathogenic variants. And then there's a spectrum of going to those that would be considered to be not clinically actionable. Benign is still a charged word to some, and there's that space in between. And we hope that this group will be able to work and figure out the best possible Venn diagram to sort of encompass the different classification schemes and approaches for the last 10 years that many people have done a tre tremendous amount of work. And again, it's not reinventing the wheel, it's rather just looking at it from the umbrella, as we'd like to think of it, the GA4GH, and asking the question, how do we make this most inclusive and most useful to the community at large? And there will clearly be lots of inside and, and under the hood activities that will go in different directions. And so working towards this sort of common classification is something that'll take time. So here's a slide that Heidi um, had put together, and it's already, I think, in its second or third version just in the last week as we've had teleconferences and people looking at this and thinking about sort of these three steps from data submission to data aggregation and data curation. And I guarantee that by 2.30 tomorrow, this slide will look differently. And it's put up there with the word draft for a very good reason. But that's why we're all together. And we think it's going to be very important to be in a room to work out some of these details in terms of what the flow uh, 
in the connectivity because then we turn and go to David Hausler and, and, you know, and Richard and their group and say, all right, here are what we would like to see as the primary deliverables and this is the way we'd like to see the information organized so that the informatic solutions would reflect what we think the, you know, the best experts in the science are really thinking are the priorities. We can't do everything all at once, so we're going to have to do this in steps, excuse me. But we, we think having some kind of data model like this will be very useful. We've already seen some very interesting early preliminary looks at the population genetics allele frequency that, that you know, David and his group have generated that are very exciting. And I think these will continue to move forward and we have to think of these as works in progress. Clearly the long-term deliverable that we'd all like to get to, but this is going to take you know, a, an extended period of time is really being able to improve the risk estimates, the penetrance, so to speak. And I think for that, we're going to need more information. We're going to need to figure out how we're going to be collecting the non-genetic information in a unified and intelligent way. And uh, I think a good part of this is going to be prospective, but that's not to say that the very important and the very arduous work of many that has gone on until today or whatever uh, is going to be valuable for that foundation. And I think we, this is where we really want to go, but I, this is going to take time. And this is why we broke it up very particularly into these three steps. One and two we think are clearly realizable in months, whereas this is going to take an extended period of time and may evolve into something else. And we just have to be open to the dynamic nature of scientific collaboration and observations and the like. So, let me go on this. I also want to say a statement of purpose, and we had a conversation uh, with the steering committee uh, last week, that this is, the scope of this is really to help and to have a curation of the BRCA variants that represents a critically needed resource for the community. And we've, with our, our mass email that we sent out last May, we've already identified maybe 18 or 20 places around the world that have not put data into existing data uh, repositories who were very interested and these come from other continents like in Malaysia, countries like Hungary, South Africa and we want to be sure that when we go back to these potential you know, uh, submitters that we have some kind of structure to begin to collect and, and to be able to, to bring their data together. So we think this is very important. The second bullet point is really the key one. The BRCA challenge will not yet issue formal recommendations for the clinical implications, but we have to understand that this information will be used in each country and, and in each clinic and with each investigator, we'll be able to use this information to make very important personal decisions because medicine, again, comes down to one patient at a time. It's not about a thousand or ten thousand. Clinical studies are made up of individual patients that are being organized. And I think you know, this is a very fine line. Insight has, you know, addressed this very adeptly. And I think if we can get the consensus and really build the structure, we may move towards this. But this will be something new for the GA4GH. We haven't really talked about this, but, I, but this is really, in our minds, an important long-term issue to be thinking about. And I just thought it's important to put this right up front. So the challenges ahead are obviously for us tomorrow and in the weeks to come to finalize. I think we have the terminology and the classification issue certainly will be a very interesting discussion and have the broad inclusion of data sources. Again, Peace Corps mentality, single deposition and stable oversight of the curation. And this is very important as we think ahead of really what are the funding and future challenges. The short term is we, I think we've already got the engagement of a tremendous amount of the expertise out there. People who, there's no point in reinventing the wheel, but rather bringing them together to come up with the wisest consens consensus for these things and building that infrastructure that's both informatic and scientific with a distributed model to be able to ensure that people continue their projects and can be granted, seek funding from their research opportunities or their diagnostic opportunities to pursue the things that are important. But in the long term, we have to think about how are we really going to keep this going. We may get all this data, but it's, go it's going to need to be looked at, it's going to need to be followed, it's going to need to be updated. There will be new questions, new ways of looking at it. And that's where I think we have to think about how we're going to, to fund that. And that's, again, where the question of the GA4GH versus the different elements that are part of a sort of a federated model. And I think we're all feeling our way through that, but it's an, an important thing to at least acknowledge. So let me just end by saying here the BRCA challenge in our mind 
is kind of scary. Uh, neither John or I are BRCA experts, but we certainly have been in and around this space. But we are certainly willing to jump, and there are many others who are jumping with us, and it's really a lot of fun. And we're looking forward to certainly the next 24 to 36 hours, and then the next 36 months after that. So why don't I stop there? <laughs> Um, so we are tight on time, but if anybody's got a pr anybody who's not going to be involved in the meeting tomorrow where you'll get lots of time to discuss it. So if anybody from the rest of the audience has got something they really want the Sundance kids to hear um, before they take the next jump, please uh, move to a mic and we'll, we'll take a few questions quickly. The first one. So, um, so Butch, um, <laughs> so how do you see these efforts? In a, there's a number of, you know, pretty well-funded patient registry efforts that are kicking off. Prompt is, is one represented by people who are on your committee, and there's many others. How do you see that interacting with what you've been discussing as part of the GA4GH? Yes, we see them interacting quite, uh, I think, uh, extensively. And as you point out, the, for, for instance, for Prompt, the leadership of Prompt happens to also be within the scientific steering group. So I think Again, the, these are the kinds of models that this is just not an academic group of individuals. We certainly encourage and want to see, particularly in BRCA 1 and 2, the commercial and diagnostic uh, opportunities really being integrated to the extent to which they can and hopefully will be encouraged and don't want to be left behind. Okay. Hey, Center Mike. Hi, I'm Bob. I'm Bob Kuhn from UC uh, SC Genome Browser. And uh, I have a comment about your overlapping Venn diagrams, that uh, the overlap from the various databases is oftentimes the same record distributed over more than one location. Other times it's the same item discovered in an individual patient somewhere else, uh, which brings up the whole idea of the universal record locator as a way to maintain the provenance of a, of a, a given I item so that when it migrates from database to database, you know when you've got duplications and when you've got a new instance. So can I say that um, we've got Johan Den Dund in the room who has done tremendous work on this in LOVD and I think we can get around that but I absolutely, we absolutely recognise that as a challenge. It, it's less of an issue in the sense that we just simply need to know that the pathogenic variants exist. If it's reported more than once that's not the end of the world as long as we don't use that as part of the definition of its pathogenicity. But since we do in our probability calculations look at the frequency of reporting then obviously that's a, a, that's a danger that we need to address. And we can get around that by having depths of knowledge within the database about where it came from and who reported it. And one of the powers of the European data, which is stronger in this sense than the American data, is that we can go back to families repeatedly. You know, we can re-access those medical records in a fairly straightforward way. And in fact, we're working in the UK to link our BRCA records directly into our obligatory cancer record so that in fact it has to be put in there alongside uh, cancer registration. So we can, I think, get around that, but your, your point is well taken. It's a very important issue. Okay, Bob. So again, Bob cook -Deegan from Duke. One, um, one question for you all is I saw that you had the free the data and the sharing clinical reports among your nodes that are gonna be flowing into this diagram. One of the things that just changed on October 6th is a direct individual right to get your data not just the report, but the underlying data from a lab that is HIPAA certified in the United States. It's a brand new pathway. And I'm just announcing this because we don't know what to do with this, but it seems like we could route a, around a lot of the damage by getting individual access, making it really easy for somebody to push a button, sends off a message to whatever lab, it could be Myriad, it could be any of the other labs, some of them are already channeling their data into ClinVar, some of them aren't, but it wouldn't matter because an individual could push the button and say, give me my data, and then push another button and said, push it through to somebody who can process that and put it into the databases. Right. Are we thinking in that term? Uh, yes, I mean, I think I can tell you within the NCI where we are building a genomic a data commons for a lot of the uh, publicly funded sequencing, TCGA and other large studies, and Barbara Wald and others have had this idea of the sort of the, the donor card that someone who, you know, it's the patient who can donate their particular sequence. Because remember, there's a vast amount of sequencing going on outside of academic protocols right now where particularly in cancer genomics where there, people are being sequenced in private clinics and different places. And the question is how and in what way 
can we incorporate that information? And I think that's one that's something we clearly are exploring and would want to be able to include. Exactly how we do that on, and bringing it in, I think, is going to be daunting. And that's why we sort of have this stepwise of wanting to build with the you know, the clinical and the, and the public databases to begin to start that federation, and so to speak. But I think ultimately we would want to be able to receive all of the, so to speak, genomic donors who would want to put their sequence or some part of their sequence into a database like this. And I think particularly in the cancer world, we very often have very motivated patients. When we have these discussions of do you want to share your data, they look at you like you're crazy. Why is that even a question? Here I am, you know, faced with lung adenocarcinoma. Why do, you know, whatever this can do to help myself and others is an obvious thing. And so that's not to say other groups don't do that, but in the cancer world, you know, it's yeah, often. Yeah, and you guys are working with the constituencies that are most organized on the yeah. whole planet. Breast cancer organizations are just, that's something that I think maybe we could all think about. How do we build these connections for the social network nodes to connect flows of data that, that aren't through the research institutions that are on your steering committee, but so, are actually through all sorts of other Can, yep. yeah, can I just quickly say <laughs> that I think the, the second way of approaching this is to move towards getting part of the accreditation of diagnostic laboratories, that they automatically share their data. Yeah. And we've been talking about that in Europe, and I think it's achievable because you can build it on the uh, quality basis. How do we know that your lab's doing its job? unless we can see how many variants you're identifying in these genes, because that's a good way of knowing you're sequencing correctly. And I think we can do that probably in Europe, and that would be a better way of doing it because it's consistent. And certainly Buck Strom from Quest, who came to our meeting at, uh, that uh, Paul Flycheck and, and others were at in at Sanger in 2011, was absolutely enthusiastic about that. It makes money. You know, they want us to do this. There is this very specific issue for Myriad, but every other diagnostic company and diagnostic lab just wants to get the result out the door so they can have their lunch. You know, they, they don't want to hang on to this data, and I think we're pushing an open door. Okay, I'm gonna let David take the last comment question, and then we'll switch yeah. gears, and the person who did the complex slide will come up and talk about Matchmaker. So, so while Heidi comes up, I know we've moved on, but I just wanna publicly thank you both and everyone else on this steering committee I think in this whole effort that we're all engaged in for however you want to count, six months, a year, our whole lives, this may be the killer app. And what I mean by that is what will capture the world's attention? What will make it clear to all the stakeholders the value that exists? When you said, John, do it for the families and the patients. It is quite honestly an outrage, and it's not limited to this disease, so I'm not picking this one in particular, that every person who would need this information, that their doctor doesn't have it available to them. When you do this, when the group of you doing this with the support of other people in this room, you should be like showered with glory, okay? <laughs> Funders should fund this, okay? And if you fail to do it, shame on you. <laughs> And I think that we should all hold you to this, and then we should celebrate you and nominate you for awards and give you lots of money. But you have to do it because it's so important. All right. Thank you.